you. Well, good morning again. <clears throat> we are going to get right into the Word of God. Go with me to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. <clears throat> we have been <clears throat> watching the progress of the Life Team system that we released um, a couple of weeks ago. It has been amazing. Things are going really great there. Uh, it has been amazing, just no glitches and things. I mean, it's just, uh, I don't know if there have been no glitches or if Zach is just so quick at getting them that before I see them, they see them and get it taken care of. So, um, but it has been really good. People are joining up. Uh, that means they're getting trained, getting certified as divine healing technicians and moving uh, forward and then starting life teams, starting their study groups first. And then they get their study groups and they start going through uh, the material that uh, we provide for them. And then uh, over a period of time, then they become a life team and then they start actually actively uh, reaching their city. So it's, it's a lot, it's, well, like I said last week, this is, um, there is no other system like this uh, in the church today. And the way we're seeing it, I do believe that in the very near future, uh, other churches will begin to either replicate what we're doing or they'll be using this system themselves. So we're, we're really excited about it. Uh, a lot of amazing things are happening. People are being, uh, people are multiplying themselves. They are doing the work. They're making disciples. They're reaching out. And so we are really excited about how things are going. So hopefully you found Colossians chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 1. <clears throat> it says, if you then be risen with Christ. So is that, is that you? Am I talking to you? Okay. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the, on the earth. Now notice he says that literally twice right after each other. Now, you have to remember too, when you read the Bible for us, you know, you can run down, well, we can go in the bookstore and we have some Bibles in there that are uh, really inexpensive. Uh, it's like, you know, $3, that kind of thing. Then you can buy the paperback books. You go to Mardell's, you can find them in cases of like 60 for, you know, $30, something like that. It's amazing. Um, it wasn't always that way. Uh, back in the day, uh, whenever you wrote a letter, uh, many times it was really expensive, and people complain about the postal service today and the cost of letters and things. But even back during the, what people would call during the Wild West days, uh, just to send a letter across the United States costs what, what would be the equivalent of about $5 today. And so uh, we're still way below that. Um, so back when Paul would write these letters and how they had to uh, get the paper, make the paper, it, buy it, the parchments that they used, sometimes they would use uh, actually uh, treated animal skins to write on, different things. But regardless, it was in, uh, well, let me just say, there was not a lot of uh, supply. And so it was expensive to write letters. And for Paul to write this and say something twice shows how important it was because, believe me, uh, if you look at the early Greek manuscripts, man, they, there was not hardly an inch anywhere around the edges or anything that wasn't being used. I mean, they went from edge to edge. They didn't put any uh, spaces between the words, nothing, and then they would put them right on top of each other a lot of times. It was just amazing how much they crammed on one page because it would be so ex expensive to do. And so for Paul to repeat himself like he did at times, it had to be important. So here he tells us, <clears throat> if we're risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So he says, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. <clears throat> when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Mortify, that means kill, okay, put to death. Therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Now, he's talking about uh, in your own body the things that you need to kill in yourself, right? Uh, he wasn't writing to the church of Colossia and telling the pastor there, kill your members, right? He, he, wasn't, he wasn't saying that, okay? He says, and then he gives us the list. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Now, uh, at a future date, we will take these things, go through them individually, and detail them as far as what it's referring to. 
But notice this is New Testament, and Paul says, for which, things this, for which things sake, the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. So there is still a wrath on children of disobedience that was coming at that time. How many of you know we're in the same time? Right? So there is that aspect. Now, the way that it comes is through sowing and reaping, because if you're doing the thing, then it causes the thing. You got that? So if you don't want the thing, don't do the thing that causes the thing. Isn't that simple? All right? Okay. Now, he says, in the which you also walked sometime when, when you lived in them. But now you also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. But now notice what he says here. <clears throat> if you go back to verse 8, put off all these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another. You notice how many of those things have to do with your mouth? Almost all of them, if not all of them, right? All of them can include your mouth, but some of them are specifically dealing with what you say, right? <clears throat> he says, let no, and, and then he said to put away, uh, put off all these, even filthy communication out of your mouth. One of the things that has amazed me now uh, is how quickly, you know, for years you could see society kind of degenerating. But in the last year, uh, if you go to the bookstore, which I'm in bookstores fairly regular uh, on every continent, and I even go to bookstores in countries where I can't speak the language. <laughs> can't even read the books that are there, but I still walk through there. Just, I don't know. It's just something about a bookstore. Okay, <laughs> that, that and, um, well, Cinnabon. Well, I'll go there. Anyway, it's a whole nother. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, can I get a witness? No. <laughs> so, no. Um, but I'll go in these bookstores and I can't even speak the language, can't even tell what the books are saying, but you go in and, you know, you look around, hopefully you can find something and all you ever find maybe are children's books in English. That's, that's usually the only thing you can find there. So, um, but it's amazing because if you go right across the street here uh, to the bookstore across the street, uh, you will find books that in the bestsellers, like in the top, I think they have a list of 25 what they call bestsellers. There's your top 10 and then there's roughly 15 more on a whole shelf. And out of that, you will find at least eight that have what we've always referred to as cuss words in the title. In the title. And I mean, and it's, it's now it has become so acceptable and you're going to see it more and more in, 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 you know, it's, it's in the movies, of course but you're going to see it more and more in everyday language. And the thing is, is that in my personal philosophy, uh, I've never been a, a big cusser. I mean, even whenever I was running from God, it just, you know, well, first off, I'm a Southerner, and so we didn't cuss around women. You know, we reserved that for when there was only men around. And even then, I wasn't a big cusser. When I went in the Air Force, it, it went up a little bit just because, you know, <clears throat> because it shouldn't have, but it did. Okay, so... But um, regardless, I've never just cussed for, uh, you know, just because I, because I was at a loss of words. Person, I believe, if you have to resort to cussing, it's because you have a very limited vocabulary. Amen. Right? I, I would much rather learn bigger words and cut you to pieces so that you wouldn't even know what I was talking about. <laughs> right? So, you know, you just go in. And, I'm going to look that word up. I'm, I'm sure it's not good. I'm going to go find out what you just said to me. So, so but if you have to resort to cussing, uh, to get your point across, then you have a limited vocabulary. You should really expand your vocabulary uh, and, you know, quit the gutter talk. But now it's becoming common. Matter of fact, there's even some uh, top, amazingly top, uh, you know, they would call them top tier uh, motivational speakers and entrepreneurial speakers and like that literally, and the, and the bad part is the, this one guy I'm talking about in particular, um, <clears throat> he is known for his ability to impact the youth. And it's like he cannot make a sentence without the F word. Can't do it. It's just constant, you know. And, and uh, you know, that's not the only word. I'm just saying that word's always there, plus all the others, too. Uh, but it's just sad because that makes it now everybody imitates him. And so now everybody's doing the same thing because they think that somehow uh, brings emphasis, right? You shouldn't have to use cuss words for emphasis. So, uh, but again, you know, that's just the this, this state that the country has gone to, to a large degree, and it's becoming more and more uh, prominent, and the bad part is, and especially, you know, there's television shows, things like that, that now, uh, you know, the F word is big, 
Uh, other words also are now allowable, which used to, uh, you, there were words you could not say on television. Now anything uh, is acceptable except using the name of Jesus in a good way. Uh, you know, you can't, you, you can use it as a curse word or as a, an expletive, but you can't praise him, you know, without somebody getting upset and offended. Uh, so it's sad because it just means that it's going to become more and more prevalent. And the bad part is those words, well, they are filthy communication. And because, you know, <laughs> I told a person one time, I said, you're saying, with the, you're saying with your mouth what you wouldn't even hold in your hand. Mm. And just think about that. So anyway, okay, so. Okay, so. <laughs> you say, what, what are you talking about? You, you figure it out. You figure it out, okay? <laughs> so now, but it's just, it's gotten to that point. And so, but it's because we have just simply lost all sense of civility and any type of sense of propriety and especially having uh, taken in other people's sensibilities and taken those to heart. And yet, and you know, the funny thing is, is that this exactly lines up with Scripture because Paul even told us in the last days, uh, well, Jesus said it first. He said, the love of many will grow cold. Well, when love grows cold, then you talk like this to people. And it's sad now because we've made the switch to where if it's really cool or really good, we say that's bad. Matter of fact, the newest word is not even bad. That was in the 80s, uh, you know, and then it kind of moved on. And now it's sick. Everybody, oh, that's sick. I'm like, wow. Uh, that, you know, it's like if there should be a clear-cut difference between Christians and non-Christians, it should be in non, and, and Christians should not be using that word for emphasis, right? Uh, you know, or if you do, <laughs> get ready to have what you say because it's just that simple. So anyway. Trying to stick on topic here today. Now, <clears throat> notice though, he says in uh, verse 9, uh, yeah, lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So now we know what's in you. If you're born again, you're renewed in knowledge after the image of the one that created you, right? That's what's in there. So that should be what's coming out, okay? Then he says, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Now look at this next one. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. What does he say? If you have a quarrel against anybody, you forgive. Notice, and I'm going to show you some things also that Jesus said, and some things people don't realize, but you can, here he didn't say if the person repents. He didn't say if the person comes to you. Matter, matter of fact, uh, we're, we're going to look at this in just a minute. He says automatically, if somebody does has a quarrel, if you have a quarrel with somebody, forgive. Automatically, just forgive, right? And you can do that before you see them. You can do that before you talk to them. You can do that before you get on the phone to them and try to make amends. You can actually do that as soon as it happens. You need to, to, to take care of it. Why? Because if you leave something. See, the Bible even tells us not to go to bed uh, angry. Right? Why? Because when you let things sit overnight, here's what happens. If you plant a seed in dirt and leave it overnight, by in the morning... Now, you wouldn't be able to tell it necessarily, but most of the time, that seed would have already developed little fibers around it that look like a little fur around it. Why? Because it's starting to germinate, and it's starting to grab hold of the soil around it. And it starts to get what we, well, well in the natural, it'll build up a root system and starts to develop. In the spiritual, it's called a root of bitterness, and it starts to take root. When you let it sit overnight, it starts to take root, Right? And so anything, if you let the sun go down on your wrath, guess what? You're going to wake up in the morning mad, right? Something's going to go on. You're going to have that ought against that person, something. And the longer you wait, the harder it gets to deal with it, right? But as a Christian, you have no option, right? This isn't something, well, that's hard. Well, you should have took care of it when it was little, right? That's why you spank them little ones when they're little. You, know, you don't have to deal with them in the court system when they're old. Right? So, anyway, whole other thing. Okay. Now, <clears throat> my pastor used to say, some, some kids, you can pray the devil out of them, some you got to beat them out. 
So, <laughs> that, was a, that, was a, that was the old school parenting technique. You know, it, <laughs> it does work. It does work. It does work. If you, if you train them up that way when they're old, they'll not depart from it. Amen? It didn't say they wouldn't stray in the middle of the time. It says when they're old. Right? So you can always know they're going to come back. Right? So there's hope. Right? Now, he says here in verse 14, And above all these things, put on charity, love, which is the bond of perfectness. Think about that. We could say the bond of perfection. Then he says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. In other words, listen, you've got to forgive them. Why? Because you're part of them. You ever, well, there's all kinds of things that go into this, but they even say now, uh, according to science, that, and this, this is a fact, we've actually seen this. You know, we talk about words all the time. Um, if you do research, as I deal with people all over the world all the time, and so I listen. I don't always write down everything, but I make notes of things. And it's amazing whenever I hear, uh, now women do this more than men, but men also do it. Um, men, okay, we don't like to draw attention to our body, right? Uh, especially any parts we don't like. You know, we're, we're more of the, you know, don't look at this hand, look at this hand over here, right? <laughs> so, you know, and so it's kind of like, when we come out, it's kind of like, what do you think? I'll, you know, I just, you just, you hide whatever you're not, you're not happy with. Women talk about it. And they'll talk to other women about it. They'll talk to their husbands about it. I don't like this about my body. I don't like that about my body. I don't like this. And, and when you hear that on a regular basis, here's one of the things I found out. <clears throat> women that talk bad about a particular part of their body usually end up having illness or disease in that part. We see it all the time. I, I'm telling you, I hear it all the time. I hear it all over the world. It doesn't matter what language. It doesn't matter where it's at. Any part of your body that you curse with your mouth, guess what? It's going to start to die. And when it starts to die, then that is sickness or disease or illness. Your, your spirit is so amazing. And I, and I know I'm getting off a little bit here. I'm trying to stay. But your spirit is so amazing. It is so strong that that's why it's so important that you watch what you think and what you say. Because when you say something and you think a certain way, your spirit goes, oh, okay, that's what you want. And it, it goes about to bring it to pass. And as it goes about to bring it to pass, it, so if you talk negative, it, it, it doesn't care. It does not care. Your spirit is like a machine. It does not care, good or bad. All it goes by are the directions you put in. It's like having a computer. Your computer doesn't matter what, it, it doesn't care what you type into it, right? Whatever you type into it, it's going to go on the screen. It's just that simple. And if you type in, you're looking for something in the search thing, it's going to find it, right? That's how your spirit is. Whenever you are thinking about something, your spirit finds it. Your spirit actually causes it to actually come to pass in your life. Now, you can believe this or not, but I'm telling you, it's science, and we can prove it even to the level of epigenetics, to where you start speaking about certain things, thinking about certain things, and you flip on certain genes in your body that should have never been flipped on, right? And so the, this is fact. Now... And so it is important that you realize that. And now he said, don't let any filthy communication come out of your mouth. Why? Because your spirit hears what your mouth is saying. And if you're saying just filthy stuff, then guess what? You're going to have filthy stuff, right? And what we talk about filthy, it's, there's a wide range of things. Don't have a time to go into it today. But anything negative, anything that is not in alignment with the will of God, anything that doesn't pertain to life and godliness, anything that is not life in abundance is filthy communication. Right? Let's just draw that line, make it real easy. So, now here's the other thing. <clears throat> you, I've, I've, you know, some people say, well, I, you know, I watch that program. Really, you watch that program? Why? Well, you know, it's this or it's that. You know, okay, uh, but it's filthy. You know, the, all the jokes have uh, you know, double innuendos in them. Uh, you know, they're talking about one thing, but it means something else. Or, or they're you know, using foul language constantly. And yeah, but you know, it, it's just so funny. Or all, you know, what they would call alternate lifestyles, which actually falls under... What I read earlier, which is uh, inordinate affection, right. it's the same thing. Yeah. And so whenever you look at these things, what you hear, you think, yeah, but I, you know, I don't agree with that. I'm just, you know, I'm just, I, I'm just laughing at it because it's funny. And the thing is, the, the bad part is when you hear something enough, it starts coming out of your mouth. And when it comes out, number one, it, it makes you think that way. You start thinking, even if you don't agree with it, you're thinking. Yeah. You ever notice one of the things, what, many people, what they fight the hardest against is what they fall into. 
Why? Because that's where their mind is. Yeah, I, I, you know, that's one of, the, one of the best things you can do for an atheist is tell them, you know what? Okay, I, I hear what you're saying. Uh, I tell you what, you go, on, go into the Bible and prove to me from the Bible that it is incorrect and that there are contradictions. You, you prove it to me. And then they'll dig in there, and as they start digging, they get saved. That's just why. Why? Because their mind is on the Word of God, even though they're trying to disprove it. Why? Because their spirit is just hearing what it's reading and it's hearing and it's putting that, and so it starts drawing what they are reading about. So whenever you hear something a lot, you'll start speaking it. So if you watch something that has a bunch of cussing in it, guess what? Cussing's going to slip out at some point. Yep. You know, uh, Usually out of your kid's mouth yeah. that heard you say it, and he will say it at the wrong time. Right. Right? <laughs> I guarantee you. Right? He's going to say, I don't know where he heard that at. He's, just shut up. <laughs> oh, I heard it from you, Mama. I heard, I heard when you, no, shut up. I mean, you just got to, because they will say it at the wrong time, right? right. So you, but you have to watch, because it will just come out your mouth. And then the real bad set, uh, part of it is when it comes out your mouth, you don't even realize you're saying it. Why? Because you're so seared to it. that you. I, I didn't say that. Yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah, I just heard you say that. Oh, no, I would never say that. Uh, yeah, you do. And so you have to realize that what you listen to comes out of your mouth. Yeah. So you, we, And he tells us, put this out. Put your affections on heaven. Put your affections where Jesus is seated. Put your affections where you are, right? What does that mean? On things that are above. What things? Things that are pure, holy, good report. Come on. The things that he told us, think on these things, right? He didn't say think on, listen, I like a joke as good as anybody else. You know, when we're on trips and we're hanging out with the team and stuff, we, we got good jokes. I mean, it's, it's fun to be around these guys, but the jokes are clean, you know, and it's, it's just good, clean humor. And we're not, pick, we're not uh, cutting other people down or each other down. Uh, we, if anything, you know, we speak by faith and speak great things about each other, <laughs> that kind of thing. So, <clears throat> but in that, so, I, you know, we like humor, but at the same time, that's one of the number one ways that the enemy tries to get stuff into you is through the humor, and <clears throat> he will try to get many times of you using humor at, at a certain time just because it's a, a good opportunity because the person kind of walked into that one. And, but you have to learn to shut your mouth, right? But if you set your affection on things above, then you're thinking on things that are good, holy, just, all these things, good report. And so therefore, that's what comes out of your mouth. And that's really what prophecy is, is that it is calling the good things out of you that God has put in you. And it's seeing those things that, you know, honestly, Usually when people prophesy to you, it's not what you look like. It's what you're going to look like because of what's in you, but it hadn't got to the outside yet. That's why they're prophesying it and calling it out and calling those things which be not as though they were, right? So a lot of times people say, oh, you know, give me a word of prophecy. Are you sure? Because if you look at the word of prophecy, just remember, you're exactly the opposite right now. <laughs> Are you sure you want that, right? Because otherwise we wouldn't have to call that out of you, all right? <laughs> so that's why we have to speak by faith. Sometimes, because <laughs> you have to look real deep, like we said in the first session. Okay, now he says here. Let, no, look at this. Uh, he says, and, and be, yeah, let the peace of God rule in your heart, to to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. That's another big thing: being thankful, being grateful. There are so many people that have so much, and they are yet still unthankful and ungrateful, and and just always worried about what they don't have. You know, I heard something the other day. It was really good. It's you know, it just makes a point. Uh, you know, it's real simple. You, you take a boat and put it out in the middle of the ocean where there's nothing to see but water all around, water underneath it. I mean, just water everywhere. And if you get enough of that water on the inside of the boat, it would sink. So the real key is keeping the, all that water. You want a lot of water outside the boat. You don't want that much water inside. It's the same thing in the world. We're in the world. We're not of the world. Man. But the problem is if we let the world in, now we are letting the water in that will sink our boat. Okay? And we are supposed to be the ship you know, that's out there uh, rescuing people, not the boat that's taking on the water and starting to sink and being just like the world. All right? So we need to make sure that it's not the water on the outside. You know, and, and two, Christians, I mean, I understand you have to, you know, we need to be around people because we're supposed to make disciples. But at the same time, you can be of the world but not, or you can be in the world but not of the world. Does that make sense? Yeah. But, so it's, it's many times we don't want to get around people because, well, you know, it's like this. I, I get that. I'm not talking about fellowshipping with them. But you still have to be salt in this world, right? And you can still get around people and minister to them and, and you can be around them. But it's not letting what's out there into you, right? You're to be the light. 
not let their darkness into you to put out your light. Right? So, all right. He says here, now look at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And notice what he says there. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord. In other words, don't be doing anything you can't do in the name of the Lord. Right? And while you're doing that, you're giving thanks to God and the Father by him, by Jesus. Now, but notice what he tells in verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. What did Jesus say? My words abide in you. You abide in me. My words abide in you. You can ask what you will and it'll be done. So he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So even in every aspect of our life, we're to be admonishing, encouraging, helping people, speaking life into people's lives. And then and now go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> now remember the purpose of this. We want to talk about living forgiveness, right? Not just forgiving, but living in forgiveness, living forgiveness, right? Making it part of your lifestyle to live in forgiveness. <clears throat> now, um, in verse 13, I mean, not, not, well, you're going to Ephesians 4, and while you're going there, we're going to start in verse 29. But remember back in Colossians 3.13, it said, forgiving one another if you have a quarrel with any, as Christ forgave you. Always remember, you know, people say, well, well you know, I wasn't that bad. Oh, you're the worst. <laughs> Why? Because you think you weren't that bad. So you're saying Jesus died for nothing. So you have to realize, uh, no matter how not bad you were, you were still so bad that if you were the only person on earth, Jesus would have had to die for you. Right? right. right? So everybody's guilty, or at least was. Amen? Amen? And so the first thing you got to be able to do is recognize that, and that's part of humbling yourself before God. If you can say, well, you know, I'm not as bad as so-and-so, or I'm not that bad, or I don't do this, and guess what? Uh, that's, that's the worst. That's exactly the way the Pharisees were. That's a dangerous position to be in. Uh, and if you say you're not that bad, then you're also saying Jesus didn't come for me because he said he came for the sinner, not the righteous. Amen? And you're saying you're righteous. So that's the first step is humbling yourself before God and going, you know what? I absolutely needed all that blood from me. You know, I hope there was some left over for somebody else, but I needed all I could get, right? <laughs> so in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Again, Paul, writing to the Ephesian church, says, Let no corrupt communication com proceed out of your mouth. Notice he wrote the same thing. Why? Because Paul said, I teach the same thing everywhere I go. Isn't that amazing? If you read all these books, they all say the same thing. He said, <clears throat> Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Now, isn't that almost exactly what Colossians just said? Almost exactly about ministering grace to people, singing uh, in grace and ministering grace, but also uh, up in the er earlier one, it said filthy communication. Now he says corrupt communication, right? <clears throat> and he says, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that means to build up, don't let any corrupt communication come out of your mouth, only say that which edifies, lifts up, builds up. I heard someone on um, BVOBN, I was watching the other day, and uh, there was a lady on in her program, I'm trying to remember who it was, um, I don't remember who it was now, but, uh, but she was talking actually about um, how, oh yeah, she, well, she actually had, of course, she had a book she was selling, and so that's how she got into that, but it was a 30-day journal, and she said, for 30 days, you're not going to complain once. You're not going to do any complaining for 30 days, and instead, you're going to say good things. Instead of complaining, you're going to say the good thing, and quit saying the things you have, and start saying the things you want. And she said, so you're going to, every time you start to say something, uh, complain or murmur or grumble or whatever it is, or something negative, you're going to, if, if you catch yourself, whatever, you stop, and you're going to replace that with the opposite, which is good, and you're going to speak good. And you're going to do that for 30 days. And I thought, wow, if, if she can get people to do that, that will be awesome. <laughs> okay, just, but she was saying, if you can stop yourself and train yourself, and that's why she had this little journal thing to help her, to help you do that. Uh, this is a good idea. It's, it's great. I wish everybody would do it. Uh, because, but honestly, you might want to start with 24 hours <laughs> instead of 30 days. Because <laughs> okay? honestly, um, 30 days is pushing it for a lot of people, right? Uh, now, you can do 24 hours, 
30 times, that'd be great. Um, <laughs> but, but let's just get through one day to begin with, okay? Now, and it says, to minister grace to the hearers, and now notice this, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now, now notice this. First verse here, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit. You hear that? So apparently, you saying something has something to do with grieving the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now look at this. This is sandwiched. That's, that's verse 30. Look at verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So he went from words to grieving the Holy Spirit and back to words. So that obviously shows us that our words can grieve the Holy Spirit. Amen? I mean, there's a lot of things that can grieve him. But here, specifically, the Bible points out, words grieve the Holy Spirit. You got that? He says, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted. And here it is, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You hear that? Why did he do it? For Christ's sake, right? Not because you were so good. He forgave you for Jesus' sake, because Jesus paid the price. Be, and then it switches to chapter 5, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, okay? <clears throat> and walk in love. Now notice how he tied forgiving with walking in love. You can't walk in love and be unforgiving, right? If you say you're walking in love but not being forgiving, guess what? You're not walking in love. And that's, well, I walk in love with everybody except, okay, then you don't walk in love. It's the exception that ends up making you not walk in love. So that's what you got to focus on. Fix that. Amen? Amen. Now, <clears throat> notice, walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Notice he said, love as Christ has loved us and given himself. So if you're going to walk in the love that Jesus has put in your heart, you're going to have to walk as he walked, which means you're going to have to forgive as he forgave. Right? Do you realize he forgave when he hung on that cross and nobody was asking for forgiveness? He forgave before anybody asked him. Isn't that right? He didn't wait and say, well, I'm waiting. If you'll repent, I'll, you know, I'll forgive you. He didn't say that. He said, the, I'm talking about the people that were there that were killing him. None of them you know, were, were saying, oh, you know, please forgive us. We shouldn't do that. He didn't, they weren't doing that. But he said, Father, you know, they don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. Isn't that right? Amen. Now watch. He goes on, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Again, these are all written by Paul. And sometimes, you know, you can see if a person is, uh, if this is what they talk about a lot, it's also what they've dealt with a lot. So I'm just saying, I'm not trying to put words in Paul's mouth. I don't have to. He wrote them down, right? Uh, but apparently he dealt a lot with people offending him or doing wrong to him. But he learned how not to take offense. I mean, think about that. Look at all that was done to him. Whipped, beaten, stoned, left for dead, shipwrecked, put in prison, all these things, and yet he says, I don't, I don't hold any of that to anybody's account. Think about that. Now, you talk about somebody who walked in forgiveness. Now, you realize that happened to him pretty much every day, so every day he had to realize instantly, no, nope. uh, Jesus said, you're not doing it to me, you're doing it to him. So there we go, right? He says in chapter, in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 1, but I determined this with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness, for, now notice he didn't, he said, he said, I've determined this in myself not to come to you in heaviness based on what they were doing. He said, I'm not going to let you dictate my emotions. I'm coming to you. I'm not coming in heaviness. If I looked at you and talked to you and listened to you, I'd come in heaviness. I'm not doing that. I have chosen not to come in heaviness. You got that? And he's also the one, one that wrote to, to the Philippians and talked about joy. Isn't that right? And joy unspeakable, full of glory. All this, he talked about these things. So he had to know how to replace the, these offenses and things with joy and with peace. He says, for if I make you sorry, who is he then that makes me glad? But the same which is made sorry by me. He says, I'm not, I'm not going to be sad and upset because if, if I am, you made me that way. And then I'm going to come to you and I'm going to make you sorry and it's going to be a cycle. He says, somebody has to break the cycle, right? Which means what? Don't take offense. So. And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice. 
having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. In other words, you hurt me and you hurt me, and yet I chose to forgive, I chose to walk in forgiveness, and I refuse to let you hurt me. You already hurt me, but I, when I come to you, I'm not going to hurt you in return. Why? Because hurt people hurt people. Right? And, and broken people break people. <laughs> you know, that's what happens. So, we, at some point, we have to make the choice. Listen, I was um, reading something this week, as a matter of fact, and it's funny because, uh, well, it had to do with like a, um, it, it was a guy that is known in network marketing, okay? And he was talking about people, uh, because we were talking about leadership, and had been dealing with leadership and training leaders. And he made a statement, so I looked him up and started list, uh, reading some of the stuff he said. He said, the difference between leaders, okay, in network marketing, you have leaders, and then you have distributors. And he said, the difference between leaders and, and distributors is they both have the same products, they both have the same job, more or less. They both have the same goal. Everything's the same, except how they think. Leaders think differently than distributors. And if you want good leaders, you've got to get them to change thinking like a distributor and start thinking like a leader. And so, and he goes into this, and automatically I'm, you know, translating this into Christianese, you might say. And I, I started thinking about it. I'm like, you know, that's exactly right. Because, you know, we have leaders in the church and we have Christians, which are supposed to be what? Distributors of the life of Jesus Christ, right? We're supposed to be distributing it. And it's amazing. You know, if, if I could, not doing this, and we have to make sure we make this clear. Somebody will take these words and tweet them out or something. If I could take Christ and actually make him a product that you could sell. Now, I know this has been done. You turn on Christian television, you see it every 30 minutes. Okay? So I know that's been done. But if we could do that, if I could, listen, there are people that have never witnessed to another soul in their life. Never witnessed to them, been a, been a Christian 30 years, never yet witnessed to another person. But if I was able to take Christ and make him into a product and get you a, a commission, you'd be telling everybody, as just say, you know, come on, let's just be real. You'd be telling everybody, why? Because you'd be trying to get a, a, a good downline, you know? And you'd be telling, yeah, now you go share. Go share this because I get a kickback on every person you bring in. So we, we want a downline. And for some reason, we think that eternal life and this life of dominion that Jesus died to, get, died to give us isn't enough of a benefit or a dividend or a commission or a finder's fee or something for us to share with everybody. And that is a shame. Right? Because people still have the distributor mindset at best, okay? And, and even though that's not the way it's supposed to be. And yet they will still think distributor, but a, a distributor always thinks of problems. Here's the difference between how a distributor, a Christian, I'm talking about Christian now, between a leader and a Christian, okay? Typical Christian. The typical Christian only thinks about them. Yeah. See, a distributor only thinks about how can I get my product how can I get my commission? And, that, and they look at people like numbers. And they don't think in terms of how can I help this person. They think in terms of how can I sell this person. And that's how Christians think, right? If, if God said, listen, for every three people you get saved, I'm going to, you know, well, I was going to say we could take a year off purgatory, but we don't believe in that. So, um, <laughs> but if we did, guess what? People would be standing in line with three people. Here's my three. I got my three. Here we go. One. So, do you understand what I'm saying? I'm, I'm not trying to be ugly toward anybody or any group or whatever. Uh, but at some point, we have to realize that what we're doing and why we're doing it or why we're not doing it, right? But if, if the, the difference, though, is that a Christian typically doesn't think in terms of anybody outside themselves. See, a leader thinks about others. A leader is always thinking outward. They're really not thinking inward. And here's one of the secrets that I found is that the more outward I think, the more my stuff gets taken care of. Amen. It is amazing. I'm telling you, man. Used to, you know, you had to sit and figure these things out. No, oh, what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do that? And then I started focusing on people and instead of my own stuff. And pretty soon I'm like, you know what? I better check my stuff. And so, oh, okay, it's all taken care of. Good deal. I can focus on people. That's a dividend, right? 
That's a benefit of walking with Christ. The more you focus on others, the more your stuff gets taken care of. Now, when I say focus on others, I'm not talking about picking people apart, finding what they're doing wrong. No, I'm talking about finding what they're doing right, finding where they are. You know, I remember in the movie Jesus of Nazareth, uh, whenever Jesus uh, basically is given Thomas, um, he comes along, you know, and he's, he's got all these doubts and he wants to know. And, you know, I think I'm sure, I think. And he said, you must really uh, want to know, you know, to have so many doubts. See, e even in that movie, even though that's not recorded in the Bible per se that way, it showed of Jesus' heart, he was looking, say, he looked at the positive side of the doubt, not the, well, you're a doubter. You know, why are you always looking at the negative side? No, he's looking, going, man, if you're, if you're constantly analyzing it, it means you're thinking about it. That means you really want to know. You're really digging into this thing. So if we can start looking for the good, even in the negative aspects of people, look for where does that negative aspect come from? Where does that attitude come from? You know, is, is it truly just negative, or is it do they really want to know this, or are they really trying to move into something? Because some of the people that have been the, some of our biggest critics uh, actually amazingly turned around and have become some of our best friends, you know? And just recently, uh, you know, totally different situation, but most of you know Marty and Bridget uh, from Canada. Awesome people, have always been awesome people. They've never been a critic, uh, so don't tie them to the statement <laughs> I just made a minute ago, <laughs> okay? But uh, amazing people, I love them dearly, and, and they are just great people. And we were talking, uh, he was talking about a recent DHT that he did, and he said it was like, you know, trying to, uh, I can't remember what it is, swim through mud or something like that. You know, it's just a typical thing you run into a lot of times. And I said, yeah, if you're getting a lot of resistance, I said, because he was in the middle of it, and I said, tomorrow, ask them how many people, find out why they're there. I said, why are they there? I said, what you're going to find out, the people that give you the biggest problems are people that are either in ministry already, they've already been teaching healing, they're hoping you're not right, because if you are right, they're going to have to change their teaching. Right? And they don't want to admit that they were wrong. And so they're going to try to argue with you. And I said, are they are people who are uh, into healing as either a, almost like a career or they're in ministry as a career? I said, but, I said, here's, here's what you do. I said, now this isn't just across the board always exactly true, but the percentage of times it is very accurate is amazing. I said, find out how many people there have lost a loved one specifically a child. And I, and I said, you, you, I said, and then you focus on those. I said, because those are the people that have skin in the game. Those are the people, they want answers. They want to know. They might not be able to save their child now, but they want to know what, and they're willing to share it with somebody else. Ask me, I know, right? And so he did that. He went back and they had like 50 people in their meeting. 24 of them were in full-time ministry. 12 of them had lost children. Wow. And I said, focus on the 12. I said, if the others come in, great. Focus on the 12. I said, those are the ones that won't quit. I said, those are the ones that will dig in and go after this. And I said, and they, won't, and they may have questions and they may cause some problems, but it's because they're wanting to get to the answer. They want the truth. And so we have to, uh, you, you can look at, and we've seen this all over the world. This is the case. People that come in that are in ministry that have been to every other healing seminar and they're just learning healing because it's part of their job or a career or they want to be somebody, they're the ones that end up, don't, they don't stick, they don't keep preaching the truth, they mix it with other stuff, and they go with whatever fad, and they follow whoever's popular at the time so that they can put their name attached, you know, their name to it somehow, and then they get followers. That's the way it works. And so uh, one of the first things I do is find out, you know, what, it, what is your why? Because if you don't have a why, you won't stick around long. You just, there, there has to be a why. It doesn't have to be the death of a child, believe me. But... That is a key indicator of, of one aspect of it, right? So, now, he says here, uh, we are in verse 5. Yeah. No, 4. Sorry. He says, I'll, I'll go back to it. He says, uh, yeah, for out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. But if any have caused grief, he has not grieved me but in part that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. So that contrariwise, you ought rather to forgive him. So in other words, you got a person who you, forgive him. Notice automatically, right? And comfort him. What does that mean? That means that the people that cause the trouble, 
they don't have comfort. They need to be comforted. And comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. In other words, like I said, hurt people hurt people. So when people cause you pain, cause you hurt, it's because they're hurt. But so often we're too concerned with our hurt that we don't know, okay, why did they hurt me? It's because they're hurt. But if, and if you don't fix that hurt, in other words, if you don't help them get comforted, they're going to hurt you again. But if you jump over that and go, you know what, I'm not going to count this hurt, I'm going to forgive, and I'm going to try to help this person, then that way you can help them, I hate to say it, just get fixed. And if you can help them get fixed, they won't hurt you again. Does this make sense? But at some point, you've got to go, you know what, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm not going to count my own hurt. I'm going to see, why did you do that? Why did you say that? Okay, let's get to the heart of that, and let's get you help. And the amazing thing is, a kind word or a soft word turns away wrath. Sometimes people that hurt you, you can try to go, you know what, uh, man, you know, what's your hurt? God will tell you. He can even tell you what, your, what their hurt is. He can tell you by a, a gift of the Spirit, a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom. He'll tell you what the situation is, and you can speak directly into their life and say, you know what, I'm sorry that boom, this happened, and tell them by the Spirit of God. And they look at you like, how, how did you know that? God told me why, because he loves you. And, and I know that's why you're kind of aggressive or, you know, lashing out. I, I get it. And so we're now, but I'm going to pray for you right now. And you watch. You can turn that whole thing around, but you have to get over yourself first. You can't take the hurt yourself and go, oh, bless God. So I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to get back at them. Now, you know, they did this to me. I'll do that to them. You can't do that. We can't render evil for evil to anybody. Amen? So now he goes on. He says in verse 8, Wherefore I beseech you, that you would confirm your love toward him. Hear that? That's confirming your love toward him. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. Now he's saying, I'm going to see if you're obedient. I'm going to check and see if you comfort him and, and confirm your love toward him. I'm going to see if you do that, because I want to know if you're obedient. So he's talking to them saying, look, this is not a choice. You have to do this. Right? He said, to whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes for, forgave I it in the person of Christ. For your sakes, right? He says, now look at this verse, verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. Now we're getting to the heart of it. Why do we need to forgive? Why do we need to live in forgiveness? So that Satan won't get an advantage over us. You get that? Say, okay, maybe the person that's doing the hurting... Maybe Satan's already got an advantage over them. That's why they're hurting. You know, that's why they're hurting people. But you don't want Satan to get an advantage over you by them passing that root of bitterness or that hurt or that offense to you and you bearing that thing. Now listen, I'm not, I, I'm not saying this is easy. You know, the answer is real simple, but I'm not saying it's easy. You have to make a choice. This means that you have to walk by faith and not by sight. You have to walk by faith in, in, in God and not just by your attitude or by your emotions. Because your emotions are, are going to say, hey, you know, I deserve to get back. I deserve justice. You know, you, we, can, we can even call it justice. I deserve, uh, you know, to, to, to be, you know, to have this person come and ask my forgiveness. I deserve that. Okay, you may deserve that. But do you really want everything you deserve? Because maybe there may be some things you deserve you don't want. Amen? But when you start saying, I want what I deserve, guess what? Uh, you, you just open up the whole package, right? And you can't pick and choose. Well, I want the things, you know, the good things, but I don't want the bad things. No, you get what you deserve if you want what you deserve, right? So he says, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So now if Paul ties this in with Satan having a plan and him doing something. Maybe he knows what buttons to push on you. And he knows exactly who can push that button. And he gets that person to push that button, right? And certain things go in certain ways. And he says, and he does that so that Satan will get an advantage over you because he knows how you're going to react. So you have to actually see that, decide at the time, okay, I'm not going to react this way. I'm going to react this way. And when you do that, Satan doesn't get an advantage, right? And his devices don't work. Now, go with me to Luke chapter 17. Luke 17, verse 1. Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he cast into the sea, 
that, than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother trespass against you, rebuke him. See, it's okay to rebuke, right? And if he repent, forgive him. Now, you have to remember, who is he talking to? Unborn again people. Remember that, right? And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostle said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. Now, you, see, we always read this passage. Increase our faith. And the Lord said, If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you would say, and that, We always talk about that part. But they were asking for increased faith specifically in response to unforgiveness. To having to, in other words, I've got to forgive him seven times. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. I need more faith. Give me faith. I need more faith. I need faith. Increase my faith, God, so that I can forgive seven times in a day. Right? And that's, I mean, you've got to take it in context. You know, I don't know if you ever heard this preach in context before. I don't know. But this is in context. They ask for increase of faith in context with people offending you. Right? Uh, anyway. You know, I was driving down the road one day, right here in 75. God talks to me a lot on Highway 75. <laughs> he has talked to me a lot, especially over the years past. Not so much now. Now I've got to pay attention to the road because people are driving crazy. Back in the day, though, back in the day, he would, he would talk to me quite a bit when I was driving. And he told me one time, right here on the, actually real close to here. Yeah, right in this area. He said, um, everybody that calls you brother ain't your brother. And I'm like, okay, Lord. Yeah, I agree. What do you mean by that? You know, and we had a conversation there for a bit, right? He said, no, everybody just calls you brother. Don't think they're your brother just because they call you brother. He said, you have to look at what they do, what they say, how they, you know, the things that go with it, not just, hey, brother, how, you know, that kind of stuff. Said, okay. So, and there were situations that came up right after that, and I'm like, oh, okay. So, you know, it made total sense. God always gives you a word before. A lot of times when he gives you a word, you look at it and go, okay, well, how does this apply? That doesn't apply. I don't get it. You know, it must not have heard God right. No, no, you heard. Just wait. It's coming. Right? That's why he said, what's on the other side of this mountain? Remember what he told Joshua? Don't be afraid. Don't be fearful. Be strong. Remember all that? That was all beforehand. Right? God always gives you a word beforehand. So that's why it's called prophecy. Pro, before. Right? There you go. Anyway. So, um, but you need to be careful too because you also have to be, if you have to be, okay. You don't have to expect everybody that calls you brother to be, be your brother. But you also don't want to say things like, you're not my brother. Because you don't know. Think about it. Okay, let's say, I'm, let's say I'm right with God, right? And you're right with God. And let's say you get mad at me and you say, you're not my brother. Okay, but if I'm right with God and God is my father, but yet you just said, you're not my brother, then you're saying God ain't your father. Right? Now, you may not agree with me. You may not like me. But when you say something like that, that's dangerous, real dangerous, right? So, anyway, just something to think about. So, then uh, he said here, <clears throat> let's do this. He said, uh, I'm going to get back down to verse, well, I might as well take verse 3. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother trespass against you, rebuke him. And if you repent, forgive him. If he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again saying to you, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. You hear that? Seven times in a day, automatically. <coughs> same, same person, Okay. You shall forgive him. End of story. No discussion. No, you can't go to God. Well, God, I don't think he really meant it. He didn't say if he really meant it. He said if he did it. Are you with me? It's not pleasant. Has to be done. Why? Lest Satan would get an advantage over you. Not over the person. Listen, forgiveness helps you. It releases that person, but it also releases you. Right? Because you, remember I told you the story, I think it was last week, about the... Two monks and the, what, the older monk carried the, the girl across the river, remember? And the younger monk got so mad and kept on going. And he said, why, why did you touch that woman? You're not supposed to pick up a woman. He said, I set her down on the other side of the river. Why are you still carrying her? Remember that? That's what, that's what offenses do, is that you carry these things and the other person can move on. Right. And yet you're still carrying them. And now that root of bitterness is getting set in your heart. And you watch, things stop. Okay, if things were happening for you, things stop. There, there's a reason for that. Why? Because of the root of bitterness. Now, he goes on. He says, uh, well, we know the story. Apostle said, Lord, increase our faith. He said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you would say the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root 
be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. Now, go with me to Matthew 18, because here's where Jesus really talked about forgiveness. Matthew 18, verse 15. He says, Moreover, if your brother shall trespass against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. You get that? It does not say go to everybody <laughs> and talk to them about it and try to win them on your side. Right? And now notice he says go to you and him alone. It does not say go to Facebook. <laughs> right? Why? Because you just try, if you go to Facebook to try to get to somebody, uh, you're not, all you're trying to do is gain support. So all you're trying to do is trying to say your side so you get support and then but only a fool answers the matter before he hears the whole thing. And every matter sounds right until you hear the other side. Right. That's Proverbs, right? That's the way the Bible, that's what the Bible says. And yet, you got people that make quick judgments because they hear one side, usually because they've already got an offense against the same person. And so they want to jump on the bandwagon and say this thing or that thing. Right. So what happens, right? Now, he says, you go and tell him, but you go to him, you tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he shall hear you, you've gained your brother. So that right there also shows, see, if somebody doesn't come to you first, now listen, I'm telling you this for the church here too, because this is how we do things, and it's how we're going to be doing things. It's how we've done things in the past, but we're going to start enforcing it. Okay? Why? Because the worst thing to do is have stuff going on, and people bickering and that kind of stuff, and it not being handled according to the Bible. So we're going to do it according to the Bible. So that's why we're teaching partially on this today. It's partially why we're teaching on this today. Okay? We're not teaching partially on it. <laughs> It's partially why we're teaching. <laughs> so, now, but notice what he says. He says, now, uh, he, but here's, here's the essence. If you go to the person, it proves you're trying to gain your brother. But if you go to Facebook or you go to everybody else in the church, you're not trying to gain your brother. You're trying to gain support against your brother. So it shows your heart. Okay? Now, verse 16. But if he will not hear you. Now, let's go over here. What does hear mean? Here does not mean hear and agree with you. If you look up the word hear, it, it, the word it says, but if he will not hear, it's two words. And the word hear literally means that he will give you the opportunity to say your peace. That's what it means, and that he actually hears you. It does not mean that he changes to agree with you. Do you get that? It doesn't mean that, uh, well, I went and told him, but he didn't hear me. Well, no, if you told him and he stood there and listened, he heard you. You get that? Now, you may not, listen, you have to realize, you may not get the satisfaction you wanted, but just because you didn't get the satisfaction you wanted doesn't mean you get to go to somebody else now and talk to them. And, and now it says, because he said, if he doesn't hear you. In other words, people want to talk to you, and you go, uh, no, I'm not going to listen to it. Okay, now you go get two other people, because that's what he says. Then take the one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. But now notice these other two, also have to know the entire situation and have to be involved and have to know why this person has offended you. How did they offend you? And they have to say, yes, that's biblical. He shouldn't have done it, uh, so let's go talk to him. Does that make sense to you? That doesn't just mean that you can bully your way through somebody and somebody saying, no, uh, you know, I, 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 that's not what I did. And then you're going to go get three more, you know, two more people and come out and go, no, we're, uh, we're going to make sure you agree with us. All right? Now, he says, uh, verse 17, And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. Right? But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. What does that mean? Well, what do you do for the heathen and the publican? You try to get them saved. Isn't it right? But you don't treat them bad. You know, for mostly, especially what Jesus, the people Jesus talked to, what that meant was you don't fellowship with them. You don't hang out with them. You don't get around them that much. You avoid them to avoid future problems. Do you get that? Right. Now, in some churches, you know, our church is fairly small, so if you're having problems with a person, you pretty much got to deal with it. Why? Because we ain't big enough for you to disappear in a crowd. <laughs> right? <laughs> you got to kind of deal with it right then. You can't sit there and be looking over. No, I'm not going to look at them. I'm not going to look at you know? <laughs> Except whenever I say something, you know, like, yeah, did you hear that? <laughs> yeah. You didn't know that one. I know who that was for. Yeah. Okay. No, that's... They, we, See, we're, we're small enough. If you do that, you'll stand out. <laughs> okay? okay? Now, then now watch. He says, now right after that, he says, Verily I send you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What does that mean? Permit and forbid. 
right? Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Now we, I mean, these are true scriptures no matter what. But notice this is in the middle of talking about someone not hearing you when you go to them. So what's he talking about the two agreeing? That this person's heart will be changed because now they're acting like a heathen and a publican and now you're going to be praying for them that they will actually get saved. Amen. So I know we've taken this to take it out of context sometimes and say things and it is a true principle about binding and loosing. But he's talking specifically about, no, this person, you're praying for a person here, not just for things, right? Do you, do you understand? This has to be in context, right? Then he says, uh, in verse 20, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, and there, there am I in the midst of them. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Because Jesus had just talked about this to seven times, remember? And so now think about this. So <laughs> you got to love Peter, <laughs> you know? He's the only one that comes to Jesus and goes, All right, I, 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 I get it, yeah, uh-huh. Uh, how many times? Seven times? Seven, that enough? Seven? I mean, because I know a guy right now, he's already, he's, we're already up to nine. <laughs> so, I'm, you know, I just want to cut him off. I'm done. I don't want to do that anymore, right? I mean, think about that, right? <clears throat> so he's here, he says, till seven times, right? And he says, <clears throat> then Jesus, verse 22, Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. 490 times, same guy. <laughs> well, in one day. 490 times, right? I mean, I don't, maybe they were on a boat together. Maybe he's talking about one of the 12. Because somebody's going to offend you 490 times in one day, you got to be in close proximity and can't get away. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know I, what, okay. I can just think of a few people in that close of proximity, usually husbands and wives. Anyway, all right, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you are. So. <laughs> so now, this does not give you the right to go, hey, you got to forgive me. I'm only up to 430. <laughs> so I got some more jabs coming at you, and you got to do it. So here it comes. So, no, it's not that way either, okay? <laughs> now, watch this. Now, after that, now watch this. He said, therefore, because it's 70 times 7, therefore, is the kingdom of heaven likened to a certain king which would take an account of his servants. Now, he's telling, now watch. Here's where he gets serious, okay? And when he had begun to reckon... One was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that, that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out, found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, okay, which was about seventeen dollars, right? From from, from the ten thousand talents I'm going here down to seventeen dollars. Think about that. And he laid hands on him. Okay, not in a good way. He wasn't blessing him. Okay, he laid hands on him. Okay, and took him by the throat, saying, "Pay me that thou owest." And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, "Have patience with me, and I'll pay thee all." And he would not but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because you desired me. Should not thou also have had compassion on your fellow servant even as I had pity on you? And watch. And his Lord was wroth. Fancy word means mad. Okay, and delivered him, now look at this, to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their transgressions, their trespasses. Wait a second. Now, that word tormentors, it literally means torturers. So again, we have two reasons now, notice, who, who is the tormentor? Satan, right? Now, what this means is, now, God doesn't go, okay, here you go, Satan, have fun. No, when it, when it says that he, he turned him over, he's using the analogy of, listen, uh, you didn't do this, now you're over here because God does not use Satan 
You can't find anywhere where God ever used Satan to do something for him. I mean, think about it. Satan hates God, wants to be God, wants to take God's place. So do you think that Satan would actually do what God wanted him to do because it's going to help a person get right? Think about it. He's not going to do it. He's there to kill, steal, and destroy. Yeah, to, to steal, kill, and destroy. Right? He's not there to help God. But a lot of people think he's, he's there to help God, and they think that God uses Satan to help. No. And what it is is when you get into unforgiveness and you don't forgive other people's debts. Okay, think about this. You can't even pray the Lord's Prayer. What we call the Lord's Prayer. It's really the disciples' prayer, but we call it the Lord's Prayer. Right? You can't even pray that. Why? Because he said, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So every time you pray that, if you don't forgive, guess what? You're saying, don't forgive me. Why? Because I hadn't forgiven, so don't forgive me. Think about that. Now, if you can't pray, forgive me at the end, you can't pray, give us this day our daily bread at the beginning. Right? Do you, do you see the whole ramifications? So what's he saying? Because we have two specific cases here of what God, through Jesus, is telling them. Okay? And what Paul said, he said, we, we, we have to forgive lest Satan get an advantage of us because we know his devices. We know what he tries to do. And here he says, listen, if you don't forgive, it's because now your heart is hard because you were forgiven. Now you're not going to forgive. And he says that this is what will happen is you will get turned over to the tormentors. Now that, what that means is if you don't forgive, okay, you're the one that gets offended, right? You're the one that takes the offense. Someone has offended you. So now you're the hurt one, but you're taking the offense. And if you don't forgive, then you're going to carry that offense. When you carry that offense, it starts affecting you. It's a root of bitterness in your heart. It stops your prayers from getting answered, right? That's one of the aspects. But it also causes you, if you don't forgive, then you end up carrying that thing with you, and it'll be in everything. Well, they hurt me, so I'm not going to trust you, and I'm not going to trust anybody else. Why? Because I've been hurt now three times, and, you know, it's say, uh, you know, if, if you're maybe a female, uh, you know, I've had three men, and they've all done me wrong. So I, I, I just, I don't trust any man anymore. Okay, now you just refuse to forgive. Because of that forgiveness, now you're tormented. Do you really think that those three guys that hurt you or whatever, or do you really think that they are sitting at home worrying about how it affected you? You're, if they hurt you, you're probably not on their mind. Right? And yet you're still carrying them. When in reality, if you forgive, it's amazing. This is what happens. There is laws in the spirit that whenever you forgive someone like that, it, uh, it frees them of their pride so that they can apologize. It's something that happens. So you don't carry the burden anymore. You forgive. Now you can forgive out of your heart, which is where? Out of the spirit, right? But it's also where it, you do it by faith. You can, okay, if you're going to forgive, you're going to have to forgive by faith. Amen. That's the way it works. That's why, in forgiveness, that's why the disciples said, okay, we've got to forgive 70 times 7. Lord, increase our faith. Why? Because you have to forgive by faith. And so sometimes your faith needs to increase, amen, just so you can forgive that person. And so as you forgive, now you don't carry that burden around because here's what happens. And you have to realize, and see, this is where the church has been messed up because they think, oh, unforgiveness, uh, that'll cause arthritis and it'll cause these, you know, these things, the bitterness and the bones and dries the bones and all that. Cause it's there. Okay, let me tell you, God is not causing that on you. Okay, he's the one who told you to forgive. Now, there are these things, okay, in us that, you know, as we talk, the genes and there's things called telomeres and things like this. And when you get into epigenetics, it shows that there's aspects even of your brain of uh, the amygdala and things like that, that whenever you forgive, it causes the amygdala in your brain to release chemicals into your body that heal you and make your immune system stronger. But bitterness, anger, wrath, mal all these things they talked about before, unforgiveness. You know what that does? That actually causes you because you nobody's mad and doesn't say it. Whether you say it out loud or you say it to yourself. Honestly, it's probably even worse just to say it to, only to yourself. But whenever you say it out loud, you start affecting the genes and you start releasing other types of chemicals into your body that actually does damage. And the longer you carry that thing, it's amazing. You take somebody that lives in, in uh, forgiveness and doesn't take offense, you will never be able to accurately guess their age. 
That's, I'm telling you, you will, never, you will never be able to accurately guess it. But you watch a person that lives in bitterness, and in a short period of time, all of a sudden, whatever in the past was, it starts to gang up on you, and it catches up. And it can happen really quick. It's amazing. So all of these things, because we are a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. And so we have to forgive. Why? So that we're, we don't let Satan get an advantage and get that root of bitterness. Because I'm telling you, you're not hurting anybody but yourself. Right? And, and the sad part is, you, that's like, you know, twice, well, let me just put it, however many days it's been since you were hurt that you have not forgiven. That's how many times over that person, you have allowed that person to continue hurting you. Because you keep that, and every day it's a brand new offense. Why? Because God counts every day brand new. Amen. Right? So it's easier to give forgiveness, walk in forgiveness, live forgiveness. Live with the forgiveness that says, I forgive. I mean, even now, honestly, Jesus said, if they repent, yeah, okay, that's a, you know, that's, you can do that. You can wait till they repent, uh, and you can carry it until they repent, and then you can forgive. But it's much easier just to forgive, and that actually helps them to repent because it releases them and you from the things that are going on. Amen? Amen? So is it important to walk in unforgiveness? Absolutely. I've, I've never said it wasn't. We just didn't spend a lot of time talking about it because I'd rather teach you dying to self so you don't take the offense, so you don't have to go through all the unforgiveness. But there are people right now in unforgiveness that you need to deal with, right? right? And I can tell you, just die to it. But a lot of people, well, I can't. Why? Because remember what I was talking about, distributors and the leaders? A distributor thinks the way they think is the only way they can think. But a leader realizes that to be a leader, you have to change the way you think from inward to outward. Amen. And if you can change the way you think, then I got news for you. You can change the way you think. Amen. What does that mean? Well, I can't feel any, other, any way other than this about that person. That's a lie. You can change the way you think about that person. Amen. right? I could give you examples, uh, different situations where people were involved, where you, know, you can look at them, how they treated you, talked to you, whatever it was, and you would be mad. But then you find out why they were that way. And you realize, oh, okay, yeah. Oh, they just had a death in their family. Oh, they just had... This happened, and oh, this thing. And, okay, I realize now why they said And all of a sudden, your entire attitude changes toward them. The way you think about them changes because now you know the back story that you didn't know ahead of time. Now, I'm not saying what they did was right. Listen, I'm not saying that you don't have the right to be mad in the sense of recognizing somebody did something to you. I'm just saying you got to deal with it. You, you cannot carry it you, because I'm telling you, it'll... In, in many ways, it'll kill you spiritually. It'll kill you mentally, emotionally. It'll cause you not to have any other good relationships. It, it, can, it just keeps eating away. It's like a cancer that keeps eating away until you get rid of that thing. You have to get rid of it. You have to forgive. Otherwise, I'm telling you, everything, first it starts slowing down, then it stops, then everything reverses, and then it starts going down, downhill to the point where you know, you think, man, just last year my life was so good. And now look. And you can chase it, trace it back to some type of offense. So you can't take the offense. Amen? Amen. Did y'all get anything out of this this morning? Yes. All right, all right. Well, we're going to pray. We're going to pray actually a couple of prayers. Uh, first off, if you, maybe that's you. You know, I don't know why God had me bring this out. I've, like I said, I've never preached on this like this before. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's you, somebody here that you're dealing with something. Or maybe it's somebody that's watching, you know, by internet, or somebody's going to watch this in the future. Who knows? You know, it's, you know, God knows what He's doing. But if it is you, then now's the time to do something about it. Don't wait. Do something about it now. Choose by faith. I'm not saying your feelings are going to change. They might not change real quick, right? They they can. As soon as you forgive, you should feel a change to a degree. But I'm not saying you're not going to feel the hurt or that kind of stuff. There's a difference, because. Uh, unforgiveness is one thing, that hurt is one thing, but y the hurt turns a lot of times to anger, and then it gets into all this other stuff that Paul said don't do. So, you, But you have to make, you have to start, you have to dig that root out, and you do that by saying, you know what, this person, whatever it was, I know it was horrible, they shouldn't have done it, uh, they were wrong, I didn't do anything to them, okay, that's great, but Christ forgave you. 
forgive them. Right? And just choose to forgive. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. Your word is absolute truth. Father, we thank you that Jesus came to die for us so that we could have freedom, true freedom, spirit, soul, and body. So, Father, I thank you that you have given us means by which to make sure that the enemy does not have an advantage over us. So, Father, even now, in the name of Jesus, we forgive. We forgive those who have offended us and hurt us and done things to us, whether malicious or accidental, we forgive. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we release them from their offense to us. We forgive them and we bless them in Jesus' name. Father, we say, in Jesus' name, increase them, bless them. And we thank you for freedom. We thank you that we have the ability to choose to forgive. In Jesus' name. Now, I'm going to pray for you. Father, you've said that if we forgive, the enemy will not have an advantage over us. You said that if we forgive, that the tormentors would not be able to bother us and to continue on, but that we should have peace. So, Father, I thank you even now that all these under the sound of my voice right now, that right now we bless them with peace. We bless them and we strengthen them in their inner man by the power of the Spirit, to set free those who have offended them. That right now, that they are free, and they have set free those that have come against them. That this is a, 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 a broken cycle now. It is broken. And Father, we thank you that now we choose to walk in peace. We choose to live in constant forgiveness, instantly forgiving, pushing off anything that the enemy tries to put within us for a root of bitterness. We refuse it and we bless those who would persecute us and despitefully use us because Jesus said to and we want to be obedient. So Father, I thank you and right now in the name of Jesus, by the authority of the Word of God, according to the Word of God, by His stripes you were healed. And there should be no reason why the enemy would have any way to remain or to continue cause physical ailments or even mental anguish, fear, all these things. But now, in the name of Jesus, as his representative, I grant your request for freedom. We set you free in Jesus' name, right now. Free, healed, and whole in Jesus' name. So be it. So be it. All right, say this with me. Father, Father your word is true. Your word is true. You, said you said to forgive, to forgive. <laughs> and I can be forgiven. Well, you forgave me, so I forgive others. And I receive all the forgiveness that you have for me. And I give all forgiveness to others. So today, I set them free. And I thank you, Father, that today, I am free. I have forgiveness from you, and they have forgiveness from me. We are free, we are free. Brothers, and sisters, brothers and sisters, in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. So, be so be it. Amen. 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 Let's give him a shout. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. All right.